Hello. This short lecture mostly focuses on histone modifications, which are considered by many as epigenetic marks. But how do we define epigenetics? There have been several definitions depending on one's perspective, but this definition is one that relates to genetic heritability. Myotically and mitotically heritable changes in gene expression that are not coded in the sequence itself. A good example of epigenetic inheritance in man can be found at the homeotic genes. The Hox genes, shown here, encode powerful transcription factors that drive the gene expression programs that define body patterning and anatomical structures in the developing embryo. It is critical that the patterns of Hox gene expression established in the embryo are maintained so powerful epigenetic mechanisms are used to silence Hox genes from inappropriate expression in the wrong tissues. So I'm showing here um, four Hox clusters, A, B, C and D, and there are multiple genes present in each, and they're expressed in different places uh, within the developing embryo, and you can see this all the way through to somatic tissues um, in an adult. There are three main molecular contributors to epigenetic regulation. These are modifications of the histone proteins that are involved in packaging DNA, which I shall go into uh, mostly in this lecture, the methylation of the DNA template itself, and also non-coding RNAs which can influence both histone and DNA modification. These contribute either to heritable silencing of a specific gene target or to heritable activation states of genes to favour their expression in a given tissue. The template for transcription is not simply the DNA double helix that you might see in textbooks, it's actually chromatin. Every single human cell contains about one and a half meters of genomic DNA. How is this folded into a small nucleus in each individual cell. Well, it's done through proteins called histones, which um, the DNA is wrapped around, and each uh, individual unit is called a nucleosome of histone proteins and DNA wrapped around them, and we shall talk more about nucleosomes in a moment. And then there are different um, orders of packaging of the genome from the simple beads on a string where it's just nucleosomes spaced apart from each other. And this might be the state that you would see in a gene undergoing transcription. So this is an open state. And then more and more closed states where these nucleosomes are able to interact with one another, form different structured fibers, such as the 30 nanometer fiber, and even higher order structures. The nature of, an, of the specific organized structures um, during uh, uh, chromatin condensation is still an area of research and, and debate. Um, so this cartoon here is a, more of a schematic representation of, of what we expect to take place. Here's an electron micrograph um, showing a chromatin template um, in a test tube. Um, and here we can see individual nucleosomes uh, linking together like beads on a string, uh, the genomic DNA. What does a nucleosome look like? Well, the structure of it is already known. Uh, it contains an octomer of histone proteins, which I shall talk about in a moment. And around that is wrapped 146 bases of DNA, which reaches around almost twice. And hopefully you can see these two DNA gyres here wrapping the core histone proteins and you see projecting out is just a little piece of one of the histone tails and the histone tails are uh, a huge part of epigenetics so as I said there's um, these core histone proteins there are four of them and there are two molecules of each are present um, in one given nucleosome so there will be two copies of histone H3 histone H4, H2A and H2B. Each of these core histones contain this classic uh, core histone fold uh, which looks like so and all of them contain these long unstructured N-terminal tails 
and uh, much shorter C-terminal tails. Histones um, form these octamers quite readily, so histone H3 and H4 readily dimerize with each other, and then these dimers form a tetramer. The H2A and H2B pair up and form a dimer. And then in the presence of genomic DNA and histone chaperone proteins, these tetramers come together, um, get wrapped with DNA, and then the H2A and B dimers um, slot onto the top and bottom, um, and that creates this octamer, um, which then forms the nucleosome. A key feature are these histone tails, which are um, not um, present in the um, X-ray crystal structure because they are unstructured. Um, so you can see there's a little bit of H3, but otherwise the rest of it has disappeared. These tails are really quite long. They'll extend beyond the edge of the slide that you're currently looking at um, and can easily contact the neighboring nucleosomes. And these histone tails are highly charged, they're positively charged, um, and can bind to uh, nucleosomal DNA and linker DNA, and also bind to um, acidic charged patches, negatively charged patches on neighboring nucleosomes. So these histone tails have key roles in chromatin folding and in cofactor recruitment. The tails are subject to a, a, a large number of post-translational modifications. And what I've summarized here are the modifications that are well understood to be linked to um, gene transcription. So we've got acetylation, denoted with an A, phosphorylation, methylation, and ubiquitination. But there are many other kinds of post-translational modification and there are many other residues that are modified. So this um, is quite a, a complex array of modifications with which you can modify uh, the nature of a nucleosome and what, what would happen to that nucleosome. If we look more closely at histone acetylation, um, which is frequently found on the histone tails, it occurs on lysine residues. Lysines are normally carry this amine group which is positively charged and because there are multiple lysines on each histone tail that's multiple positive charges which can then interact with the negative, negatively charged DNA backbone and also interact with a, a negatively charged acidic patch on the core histones themselves which would then be found on neighboring nucleosomes. So you could visualize these histone tails and all these lysines that are present on them as sort of Velcro straps that come out from a nucleosome which are sticky and can either sort of hold itself and hug itself um, and that nucleosome then would be very stable and hard to disrupt or can stick to nearing, uh, nearby nucleosomes and thus enable chromatin folding. When acetylation occurs it's done uh, mediated by an enzyme called a histone acetyltransferase it requires acetyl-CoA um, to donate the acetyl group. When acetylation occurs, it neutralizes the charge on that lysine residue. So acetyl lysine has, has a neutral charge. That now means that if you were to acetylate all of those lysines on a histone tail, you would convert it from a, a very sticky Velcro strap to just an ordinary tail. Um, that would then mean that you are destabilizing a nucleosome by preventing the histone tails from binding to DNA and from binding to their neighbors. This nucleosome is now much more readily able to be uh, destabilized, so disrupted or, or moved. Histone deacetylases uh, mediate the opposite reaction and take the acetyl group off. Now, histone acetylation clearly has an, a direct effect on chromatin structure uh, by changing the charge of the histone tails. It's the only histone modification that does have a direct effect on chromatin structure. But histone acetylation also creates binding sites for cofactors. Um, so if a transcription factor 
um, contains or, or coactivator contains something called a bromo domain, a protein sequence called a bromo domain. A bromo domain can bind to acetyl lysine um, and it's specific to a specific sequence. So this protein here would bind this lysine 9 acetyl, whereas this protein would bind this lysine 18 acetyl. Bromo domains are found in coactivator proteins, so they're found in hit histone acetyltransferases themselves and they're also found in the switch sniff chromatin remodeling complexes. So histone acetylation therefore promotes further acetylation. If you've acetylated one residue you promote the binding of a histone acetyltransferase that will acetylate the next residue and so on and so on. So that favors something called hyperacetylation where you've acetylated all the lysines on one histone tail and neutralize the charge of that tail completely. Um, and also histone acetylation promotes nucleosome remodeling. So not only have you um, removed the charge of these histone tails, but you've then recruited the powerful enzymes that can either disrupt a nucleosome or slide a nucleosome along the DNA. So histone acetylation is always associated with chromatin opening and chromatin um, in instability, nucleosome instability. Um, the nucleosomes will turn over much more readily. Uh, the other um, key mark of epigenetic gene regulation is histomethylation, which is much more complicated. So histomethylation, again, occurs on lysine residues. Um, it can also occur on arginine residues and um, through a different process. Um, but focusing on lysine methylation, um, it's mediated by enzymes called histone methyl transferases, and they use the methyl group um, from S adenosylmethionine. And the histone methyl transferases can add between one and three methyl groups to a lysine. Note that the charge of the lysine is unaffected when this occurs. So we can have four states of a lysine, either unmethylated, monomethylated, dimethylated or trimethylated. Enzymes called lysine demethylases mediate the opposite reaction and take the methyl groups off. And these enzymes are specific to specific lysines on specific histone tails. And they'll often have a, a specificity of how many lysines they can add or take away. So some HMTs are monomethylases, others are trimethylases. Some trimethylases will only work on a monomethylated substrate. And then the demethylases, again, will either be monodemethylases or tridemethylases or didemethylases. So we have a lot of enzymes and a lot of speci uh, specific uh, lysine methylations that can take place. It's worth noting that only deacetylated lysines can be methylated. If there's an acetyl group here, then the methyl transferase is blocked from working. Um, so acetylation and methylation of lysine is mutually exclusive. And these different methyl states, mono, di, and tri, often have very different functional consequences um, because they bind completely different proteins. So histomethylation in itself doesn't predict what's going to happen. What matters is what the methylation state is and which particular lysine methyl it is. So as an illustration here, um, these are uh, five well-known lysine methylation events that take place just on the histone H3. Um, and they have very different readouts. So lysine methylation can be associated with transcription activation or with repression. So for example, uh, the trimethylation of lysine 4 and the dimethylation of lysine 79 are very much associated with the activity of gene promoters. So when they're lit up and transcribing, these promoters are highly enriched for these marks. Whereas the monomethylation of lysine 4 is more associated with the activity of enhancer elements. Lysine 36 trimethylation, however, is associated with transcription elongation. So you'll see it at gene bodies and at 3' UTRs of, of genes that are undergoing transcription, and you won't see it at promoters. 
and alternatively the trimethylation of either lysine 9 or lysine 27 on histone H3 are associated with gene silencing. Lysine 9 trimethylation is associated with the formation of heterochromatin and lysine 27 trimethylation is associated with something called polycomb repression. So we can see that histomethylation doesn't specify active or repressive, it, it specifies lots of specific events during transcription. So how does this work? Well, lysine methylation creates binding sites for different proteins. So depending on the mark, some of these uh, events um, create binding sites for coactivators. So the best example is the trimethylation of lysine 4 on histone H3. This can be mediated by the enzyme SET1, uh, which has this other name, uh, KMT2F or G. And it's one of 12 enzymes in humans that can methylate H3 lysine 4. So depending on the different circumstances or cell types, different enzymes will come in and put this mark on. Um, proteins that contain chromodomains um, bind to methylated lysine. And this particular chromodomain containing protein CHD1 is a chromatin remodeling enzyme that's associated with transcriptional activity. And it specifically binds to H3 lysine 4 when it's trimethylated. It's worth noting that there are other coactivators that contain PhD fingers or Tudor domains uh, and use these motifs to bind to methylated H3 lysine 4. And conversely, there are some co-repressors like CHD3 and 4 proteins that are present in the NERD complex. So this is a very potent repressor complex. It needs to bind to the H3 tail here and, and, and is involved in modifying at H3 lysine 9. Um, but it cannot bind to this tail if lysine 4 is methylated. So it binds here, but only when it's unmethylated. So these methyl marks are, are very important in determining which coactivators or repressors can bind and when. So lysine methylation can also create binding sites for co-repressors. So the, meth the trimethylation of lysine 9 on histone H3 is associated with heterochromatin formation. And this is done through the protein heterochromatin protein 1, HP1, and it has a, a chromal domain that binds specifically to H3 lysine 9, but only when it's trimethylated. And this mark is put down by KMT1A, uh, which is also known as, previously known as SUVAR39H, and it's one of seven enzymes that can put down this heterochromatin associated mark. Alternatively, the trimethylation of lysine 27 on histone H3 um, is put down by the PRC2 complex, polycomb repressive complex 2, <clears throat> and it's bound by polycomb 1, which is found in the PRC1 complex. And these two complexes create polycomb silencing of genes, which is a, a very heritable form of gene repression. So if we look at all the known histone modifications uh, and the enzymes that can make them and proteins that combine them, it's quite bewildering. Uh, this is a superb poster uh, created by Professor Tony Kuzaridis and Dr. Andy Bannister at the University of Cambridge in collaboration with the company Abcam. And you can download this poster from the Abcam website and I've put a link in the description. Uh, so this huge poster demonstrates all these potential histone modifications and we're going to have a, a quick look at this um, just so you're aware that there are these other modifications. So if we just focus in on histone H3 here and we're going from the C terminus to the N terminus and as we scroll through. So what can we see? Well we can see lysine acetylation and lysine methylation events which um, I've already um, described to you, but also there are phosphorylation events of serines and threonines. There are isomerization events of prolines which can change the angle of the histone tail. 
there are ADP ribosylation events, there are ubiquitination events, there are citrullation events, arginine methylation as well. So there are many residues that are modified, there are many kinds of modification, and frequently there are multiple enzymes that can mediate any given modification. I'll just scroll up to the H3 lysine 4 um, part here, um, which we discussed before. Um, so clearly there are there are many enzymes that can put down some modifications. This is the lysine 4 uh, methylation. Some do mono, some do thi, some do trimethylation. There are many enzymes that remove methyl marks, which might be specific to mono, di, or tri states only. And there are many proteins that can bind to methyl marks. And again, these might be mono, di, or tri specific. Um, so we have this very complex language here that's available on histones. And when you look at the entirety of it, you think to yourself, how on earth can I possibly uh, follow this and understand this? Well, if you're new to histone modifications and you're more interested in, in gene regulation, then there are actually seven core histone modifications which are all on the H3 tail, uh, which are associated with the main transcriptional events across the genome. And these are the ones that really you should memorize and focus on and understand. Uh, and the other modifications you can just put to one side for now. So the acetylation of lysine 9 on H3 and the trimethylation of lysine 4 on H3 are closely associated with the activity of gene promoters. The monomethylation of lysine 4 and the acetylation of lysine 27 are mostly associated with the activity of enhancer elements, but also you get some signal at promoters too. Um, un unfortunately, there, there aren't good enhancer-specific marks at the moment. But by comparing these marks with gene annotations and the annotations of where transcription start sites are, you can figure out whether you're looking at an enhancer um, that's active or whether you're looking at a promoter. The trimethylation of lysine 36 is associated with the transcription over gene bodies. And the trimethylation of lysine 27 or lysine 9 is associated with polychrome or heterochromatin silencing. So it's possible to use these seven core histone modifications to define chromatin states across the whole genome and actually can partition every single uh, genomic sequence across the across a chromosome and call it as one of these different states um, based on the histone modification signature that you can see. And this has been done uh, very well indeed by the Roadmap Epigenomics Consortium, which is this international collection of, of big labs um, that have profiled uh, chromatin states in 118 human cell types so far. And these are mostly primary cells and a small number of well-known cell lines. So what they have done is profiled these seven core histone modifications across the genome in each of these cell types and used an assay called CHIP-seq, uh, which um, detects these histone modifications and finds out what sequences are associated with those modifications. These profiles were then computationally integrated using a, a hidden Markov model, a statistical model, um, and from that you're able to generate as many as 25 chromatin states that you can segment the genome into. And then you can create um, genome browser tracks uh, which have different colors for each chromatin state that can be used to highlight uh, predicted transcriptional events or potential gene regulatory elements at your favorite gene. Um, so here is a, a, a key for um, the 25 states um, generated by the roadmap project um, and there's a lot of nuance in here, but collectively we can see that the, the reds um, denote active promoters, the greens denote uh, transcription elongation, uh, the yellow and orange shades relate to enhancer activity, uh, turquoise relates to heterochromatin, 
uh, light purple are poised promoters, which are, have got polymerase on them, but they're not transcribing yet. Um, and the purple and silver relates to polycomb states. Um, so one of them is interesting, which is a bivalent promoter, where it contains both the lysine 27 mark of polycomb and the lysine 4 trimethylation mark of an active promoter. And it has them both at the same time. Um, so this is usually found only in stem cells, and these are at genes which are currently active, um, but they're listening and waiting as to whether to decide to whether to, to stay active uh, for the rest of your life or whether to succumb to polycomb repression. And so they're pre-set up in this bivalent state to be highly responsive and, and make the decision to go down one path or another. Um, okay. So um, I'm going to go back um, to the example we started with, which are these homeotic genes, and I'm going to focus on the, the HOXB cluster, and particularly on uh, the first nine genes here, uh, HOXB1 all the way through to HOXB9, which are expressed in different parts of the embryo and different parts um, of the body. And I'm going to go on to the UCSC genome and what I've done here is um, uploaded data from the um, roadmap epigenomics um, project for lots of different cell types. So, um, so here are the HOXB genes, is what you're looking at here, uh, which are located on chromosome 17 in this particular position. So we've got these HOXB genes, and I'm sort of zoomed out to look at 135 kilobases um, covering all of these genes. So we're quite zoomed out here. Um, and what we're going to do is, is just have a quick look at what these um, chromatin state maps look like in different cell types and how they relate to the ChIP-seq data that created them. Um, so just as we scroll down here, we've got lots and lots of chromatin state maps for... Uh, lots of different cell types as shown on the left and you can see that the chromatin states uh, change very considerably between different tissue types. So I've created this simplified key for the chromatin state maps um, and if we look across the HOXB cluster in stem cells like embryonic stem cell lines or IPS lines which are effectively uh, created um, pluripotent stem cells. These are pluripotent stem cells which um, um, embryogenesis hasn't begun yet so obviously body patterning hasn't started so the decisions have not been made uh, on these HOXB genes as, as to whether to be expressed or repressed or not but they've got to listen so you'll see there's a lot of this uh, bivalent signature across these genes across their promoters and across all the regulatory elements in these genes. So there's an awful lot of purple. Um, so that bivalent state means that these genes are expressed at a, a, a very low level and they're listening, they're, they're, they're waiting for signals to tell them what to do. Whereas um, if you start to look in uh, somatic cell types where those decisions were made a long time ago, so for example, um, ectodermal tissues here, such as the skin, we can see um, a large expression all across this locus um, of these HOXB genes. Whereas if we see in the brain, um, very few of these genes are expressed, if at all. Maybe there's a little bit of HOXB2 expression. When we move down to endodermal tissues, they've got differing extents of expression across the locus as denoted by the histone modifications and as we scroll through them all we can see that uh, the extent of expression let's say here this is skeletal muscle um, extends over Hox B2 and B3 but then stops and then after that you're getting uh, quite a lot of these purple colors back again um, for polycomb uh, repression. And as we scroll all the way down to mesodermal tissues like the blood, we can see that the extent of gene expression is much shorter, it's much more contained uh, to this end of the locus 
and these genes are over at, at this end are, are in these silent states. So let's take a couple of examples, look at the ChIP-seq data and see how it relates to these chromatin state maps and see if we can make sense of it. Because uh, if you look at everything, it, it's, it's very, very complicated. So look, we're just going to focus on two cell types here. So again, here are these nine HOXB genes. And I've downloaded data here uh, for hematopoietic uh, stem cells. So these are your blood-forming stem cells that are normally present in the bone marrow of an adult. Um, but a drug has been used to mobilize them into peripheral blood, into your bloodstream. Um, and they've been purified out based on their expression of this uh, marker on the cell surface. So we've got these stem cells and you can do RNA-seq on these cells and you can see that there's clearly expression of HOXB2. So um, these are the RNA reads aligned to the genome and they should align with these exons. Uh, sometimes you see other sequence as well. So we've got HOXB2, HOXB3 expression and lower levels of HOXB4 and 5 and then it sort of peters out. And the chromatin state map is showing uh, transcription elongation states um, and, and promoter act, act, activity states, so yellows and reds and greens, all the way up to HOXB6. And then after that, we're starting to see these polychrome states of purple and grey, uh, which is uh, bivalent signatures and repressed signatures. So we're expecting these three genes at least to be off. We can't see any transcription. The chromatin state looks like that. If we look at the mark of transcription elongation, um, we can see it pretty much where the RNA is. Uh, that does make sense. And if we look at the mark of promoter activity, we can see an awful lot going on. We can see peaks associated with the promoter regions of Hox B2, B4, B5 maybe, but there are clearly lots of other elements going on as well. And that's because there is antisense transcription taking place in this locus, which I've decided not to show uh, in this figure. Um, but if we look at this polychrome associated mark, the trimethylation of lysine 27, then we can see it's accumulated over these genes of HOXB7, 8 and 9 and is encroached into the locus this far and stopped around here. And that makes sense with where the transcription is. Now, if we look in, in breast myoepithelial cells, um, so this is just an example I picked out just because the chromatin state looks different, um, could have picked anything, um, then we can see transcription over HOXB2 and B3 only in this case. Um, we're not seeing much of anything else. The K36 trimethylation is not a great uh, chip seek profile, um, but we can see some of it certainly over the B2-B3 area and the promoter uh, associated mark of, of H3K4 trimethyl is now very different, uh, good over Hox B2, uh, quite poor over everywhere else. All these other elements we saw in blood stem cells have, have, are now pretty much off. And if we look at the polychrome mark then this is dramatically different so instead of being restricted to the B7 and 8 and 9 genes um, in uh, breast myoepithelial cells, it's spread much further into the locus. It was quite high all the way up to a bound here. Um, and that makes sense with the chromatin state maps we've seen, where we can see all these purple and gray signatures all the way across. OK, so um, that's giving you some insight into to raw data, into real data of what histone modifications look like across a genome um, in a, quite a, a complex locus as the HOXB clusters. And I just want to end this lecture with a, a take home slide to help summarize where you would find histone modifications for an average gene in the genome. Um, so, so these are average profiles which largely are consistent from gene to gene. So firstly, if you, so here's your average gene that's um, going to be transcriptionally active in this green box. So here's your gene body, the transcription start sites here, so this is your promoter region, start sites here, gene body, and it's going to terminate over here. 
Well, what you'll find is RNA polymerase 2, of course, accumulates at a promoter. And then when it's undergoing elongation, it will traverse across that gene. And then it will pile up at the three prime end as it waits to terminate. DNA methylation is often low at promoters when they're transcriptionally active. So the five prime ends of genes are often demethylated. Whereas intergenic DNA is usually more highly methylated. And also the gene bodies of genes which are undergoing transcription are also DNA methylated. If we look at histone modifications, the promoters of active genes are highly enriched for H3 lysine 4 trimethylation and they have lower signatures of mono and dimethylation of H3 lysine 4 which are often just byproducts of the enzymes that put the trimethylation on. And then the gene bodies of genes um, tend to have uh, modest levels of these monomethyl marks but they also have high levels of lysine 79 dying trimethylation at the 5 prime end, so closely associated with the promoter. And um, late into the gene body, you get this enrichment of H3 lysine 36 trimethylation. If we look at a repressed gene, it's very different. We lack these active marks at the promoter. We lack RNA polymerase, obviously. The DNA methylation is quite uh, low and flat and modest across the whole gene. And the gene body tends to be enriched with either lysine 9 di and trimethylation or lysine 27 di and trimethylation. And it's usually one or the other form of repression. You don't get both at the same time. If we look at a POIS gene, it looks a little bit like an active gene in that the promoter's got some active marks on them. It's got polymerase at it, um, but that polymerase has not been allowed um, to elongate, so we don't get these enrichments of elongation marks. Uh, and often there's a reason why uh, this polymerase is, is paused, and, and in many circumstances you will find this polycone mark H3 lysine 27, and that's the reason why. Uh, this polymerase hasn't been allowed to go yet because it's in this sort of um, stuck state. It's ready to transcribe if it's allowed to, if it's signaled to, but also could easily turn into a fully polycomb silenced gene locus as well. I hope you found this lecture to be useful. Do us a favour in return and click the like button and leave a comment below to let us know what you liked or what else you would like us to cover in the future. We have lots of other lectures, tutorials and interesting videos, so browse our channel page and consider subscribing. Thanks for watching.